Number 10, the actor. Now, I've heard of method actors, but this definitely takes the meaning to a whole other level. An ace infiltrator whose real identity is unknown, that worked for the Russians back when they were an evil empire. Like Spider-Man's nemesis the Chameleon, the actor can perfectly impersonate anyone, and he was quite successful at stealing state secrets until he ran up against Tony Stark. The actor traveled to the United States and disguised as Stark easily entered Stark Industries where he succeeded in not only obtaining some important blueprints, but also discovered that Tony Stark himself was Iron Man. The actor left feeling satisfied with his work and left cleanup duty to his agents, however, Tony was able to overcome them very easily and ended up traveling to the USSR to pose as the actor to foil their evil plans. And talk about a role reversal, am I right? When the real actor returned to his employer, the Red Barbarian, he was shot right as he came because he was deemed a traitor. This didn't actually kill him though because he later resurfaced to work for the Red Barbarian to, once again, take down Tony Stark. Why not check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1963's Tales of Suspense number 42. Number 9, The Melter. Bruno Horgan was once an American industrialist specializing in weapons for the US military until a government inspection revealed he was using shoddy materials, and you can probably guess why that's not really good. Tony Stark scooped up his defense contracts because, you know, his weapons actually worked, and a bankrupt Horgan decided the only rational thing to do was to blame Tony for sabotaging his work and ruining his life. Luckily for him, and unlucky for literally everyone else, he found himself among his ruined company's assets, a weapon prototype that generated a beam capable of melting iron on contact, and this began his evil reign as the Melter. Tony was able to defeat this villain pretty easily, however, he was still deemed enough of a threat to create a new suit made out of aluminum, and good thing he did because in his second encounter with the Melter, that completely saved him. Skip ahead a little bit and we see the Melter return with a new version of his Melting Ray and team up with Whiplash and the Blizzard to take down Tony Stark under the orders of Justin Hammer. Tony was able to overcome all three of the villains alongside Cabe, and Horgan was sent to Rikers Island, where he met a nuclear physicist that helped him further augment his equipment so that it would work against Iron Man's aluminum armor. Fast forward just a little bit more, and we see the Melter reach the end of his journey at the hands of Scourge, who was posing as his assistant. Take a look at this character story for yourself, starting with 1963's Tales of Suspense, number 47. Number 8, Gargantus. Before Iron Man found his groove fighting industrial spies and the occasional world conqueror, he was stuck duking it out with alien robots like Gargantus. Created by an unknown and unnamed alien race that had been scouting the Earth for the past 80,000 years, Gargantus was built in the image of a Neanderthal because that was the only species that the aliens had encountered. It first arrived in the town of Granville and used its hypnotizing eyes to conquer the townspeople, but the aliens' plans were quickly foiled by Iron Man, who was alerted by the invasion because one of the young women trapped by Gargantus didn't show up for their date, and nobody stands up Tony Stark, so he knew something was up. After a little back and forth with the robot, Tony figured out that Gargantus was actually a robot and decided to surround it with powerful magnets that tore it apart completely because, you know, magnets. After the aliens realize that maybe the Earth's defenses are too good, they decide to fly away and we don't hear about them again until 1999's Captain America, Sentinel of Liberty, Volume 1, Number 5. Fun fact, Gargantus is technically the first villain Iron Man ever faced, so why not check it out in its first appearance all the way back in 1963's Tales to Suspense number 40, and let me know what you think of this caveman robot in the comments below. And it's seven Crimson Dynamo. Technically, in a sense, Crimson Dynamo was already introduced into the MCU. However, his actual name of Anton Vanko was introduced to the MCU as the father of Whiplash, which I think just proves my point alone as to why Crimson Dynamo is too powerful for the MCU. First introduced in Tales of Suspense number 46 in 1960. The Crimson Dynamo's armor was equipped with an array of miniature electrical generators that allowed him to generate and manipulate electrical fields for a variety of effects, including but not limited to electrical blasts, electrical override, and a disruptor field that could be used to scramble electronic devices. Wonderful. The character was so strong that they had to make a new character named Ivan and make him Whiplash, who was introduced into the comics in Iron Man vs. Whiplash, but in the comics, he was also named Anton Vanko, with no relation to the Crimson Dynamo. It's just, it's confusing as hell. Number six, Vibro. Alton Vibro was your average size model just until he fell into the San Andreas Fault while testing an experimental machine, and of course he ends up with super vibrating powers because this is the Marvel Universe, and like I said a little bit ago, if you have an accident in the Marvel Universe, then you're probably gonna end up with some sick powers. These powers allowed Alton to generate high level seismic vibrations and fire them from his hands, causing shockwaves, opening chasms, and generating earthquakes. Thinking his employer Frank and Fortney was to blame for his accident, he sought revenge on him and thus began his villain career as Vibro. After 
After two battles with James Rose, the acting Iron Man at the time, Vibro was eventually taken down with the help of Tony Stark in the Mark I Iron Man armor. Vibro hasn't only been a problem for Iron Man though, and he has also gone up against the Falcon, Nomad, S.H.I.E.L.D., the Avengers West Coast, and even Wolverine. We later see him team up with the Mandarin alongside a bunch of other Avengers to once again try and take down the Armored Avenger. Making his first appearance all the way back in 1984 is Iron Man number 186. Why not give this villain's story a read for yourself? Number 5. Tony Stark from Earth 2122. Now, there isn't a whole lot known about this version of Iron Man, but from what we do know, he's pretty dark compared to the original. For instance, he kills innocent people. Yeah, okay, that is something the original Tony would not do. Yeah, he has killed people, but not innocent people. I mean, at least not intentionally. In this world, the British won the American Revolution and control North America. And in this world, Tony is a part of the group called the Sons of Liberty. Number four, the Chessmen. Like so many criminal masterminds out there, Obadiah Stane was a bit too obsessed with the whole chess as a metaphor for controlling life's thing. So much so that he hired assassins who literally dressed themselves as chess pieces, you know, like pawns, bishops, knights, and rooks, with him acting as their king. The knight got a flying robot horse, the rook used a castle full of death traps, and the bishop, well, now that I think about it, he didn't do a whole lot. He was really only able to manipulate his opponent's actions. One by one, the chessmen went up against Iron Man with none of them actually succeeding in taking him down. However, that didn't seem to be Stane's plan. The string of encounters and events actually led to Tony's addiction to alcohol to worsen, and this allowed him to buy Stark Industries and push Tony out of the Iron Man mantle for a while. Tony eventually got his act together and went up against the chess-themed team once more and emerged victorious, with Stane taking his own life with a repulsor blast. Check out these villainous pawns for yourself, starting with their first appearance in 1982's Iron Man number 163. Getting close to the end in number three, Count Nefaria. Count Lucino Nefaria was the descendant of a long line of Italian noblemen, and he inherited a vast fortune. If only. Introduced in Avengers number 13 in 1965, damn these guys are old, Nefario was fascinated with technological advances and throughout his life commissioned scientists to create inventions that were far in advance of their current scientific standing. After allowing himself to be experimented on though, Nefario was granted absurd levels of super strength, speed, and energy projection strong enough to make him a danger to any and all superhero teams. That's why Nefario was introduced as a generic Marvel Universe villain in the Avengers instead of just an Iron Man rogue, and has had several several run-ins with both the Avengers and the X-Men. And while we've had some powerful adversaries in the MCU, I think that at this point, the super strong, fast, and energy projecting Count Nefaria is going to be saved for another Avengers movie at least, or maybe even a new big bad if they get that far. But I think that it's probably going to be a, a little much. Number 2. The Unicorn Milos Masaryk was a Soviet intelligence agent assigned to security detail at the laboratory of an inventor who was developing advanced weaponry. One of the inventor's projects was a helmet that could discharge destructive energy blasts from something called the Power Horn, and Milos came into possession of this helmet after his inventor hightailed it to the US, thus starting his mission as the unicorn of avenging the disgrace caused by the inventor's defection. His first encounter with Iron Man really isn't much to write home about since Tony let the villain walk away scot-free. However, several months later, after a not-so-healthy dose of brainwashing and augmentation, Milos returned to the US with the goal of doing whatever it takes to reverse an unfortunate side effect of his treatment. However, Iron Man was able to thwart his plans once again. The Unicorn teamed up with the Red Ghost, the Mandarin, and even Titanium Man, all of them promising to find a cure for him if he defeated Iron Man. However, obviously none of them were actually going to follow through with that. Flash forward a bit and we see the Unicorn once again make his way to the US to bring down Stark Tower alongside Spymaster and some other baddies. This was a bit of a weird time for Iron Man and the Unicorn because near the end of this arc, the two actually ended up teaming up to take down Captain Atlas. However, after they were done, they went back to being not so friendly with each other. Take a look at this magically named villain for yourself, starting with their first appearance all the way back in 1964's Tales of Suspense number 56. Number 1, The Blood Brothers. Like so many great Marvel heroes before him, there was a brief time when Iron Man was flying around having cosmic adventures with space aliens. When Thanos first appeared in the Iron Man comics, we were introduced to some of his henchmen as well, two of them being the Blood Brothers, Guri and Rahas Blood. The alien siblings acted as Thanos' as guardians of his Earth base, however, they were easily defeated by the Thing and Iron Man, and this just disgusted Thanos to the core, so he sent them away for a while to an unknown location. Years later, they made it back to Earth to try and get revenge on Iron Man, but they were defeated once again and ended up locked in Riker's Island. Fast forward a little bit and we see Rahas die and Guri go on solo, eventually becoming a part of the Hood's criminal army. Guri later had his cosmic potential unleashed and this gave him a crazy power up, and he became one of these slaughter lords under the name Brother Blood. Now it's not really said when, but at some point Rahas came back to life and the Blood Brothers reunited once again and joined a new incarnation of the Lethal Legion as a part of a contest that was assembled by the Grand Master. All these fights around the world were 
thwarted by the Avengers though, including the Blood Brothers fight in Rome, and the Lethal Legion regrouped, escaped to nowhere, and decided to stay together as a team just to see what they could accomplish together. Check out this villainous brotherly bond for yourself starting with 1973's Iron Man number 55 and try to name a better duo in the comments. Oh wait. Number 10, Arno Stark. So there are two versions of Arno Stark. The main one was when he was Tony Stark's long lost brother, but I'm going to talk about the other one. In this version, Arno was the son of Morgan Stark, who was Tony Stark's cousin on Earth 8410. In this reality, Arno is extremely smart and helps run Stark Industries. He ends up creating his own Iron Man suit and constantly uses it to help himself instead of others. He became a mercenary, killing lots of people and he even used it to sabotage his business rivals, which is really sneaky. This dude would even kill just innocent people or anyone who didn't like what he was doing and he would absolutely feel no remorse about it. Number nine, Andro Stark. Andro Stark is from the future and the grandson of, well, yep, Tony Stark. Basically in the future, Tony Stark was trying to create an AI Vortex that was supposed to help protect humanity, but instead it affected computers, took control of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the internet. It then determined that humans were evil and it tried to wipe all of them out. Does that sound familiar? Like wasn't Ultron created to help humanity too in the MCU? And why do AIs always turn evil? Anyways, he traveled back to the past and basically tries to kill Tony to stop the future from ever happening. Well, the future ends up changing, but not because he ends up killing Tony. But I mean, if he killed Tony, that would wipe himself out too, right? So you always gotta think about this time travel stuff. Stuff. You gotta think it through. Number eight, Steel Corpse. In the Age of X comic series, Tony got infected with some sort of virus that causes himself to permanently fuse with his suit. Yeah, it's really crazy. Basically, never being able to take it off. To make matters worse, his suit could function without Tony's will and it was causing Tony to slowly die since it was taking him over. Yeah, it's kind of dark. And when the Avengers were on a mission, at one point, the suit allowed an emergency override that was going to allow it to kill mutant children. Nothing Tony would do would be able to stop it. So he told Captain America to save the children and Captain America shot Tony in the back of the head. Yeah, that was a pretty dark ending. Number seven, Termite. I'm sure we all know the classic way that most people gain their powers in comics. You know, an accident happens and instead of dying, they gain abilities. Pretty standard, right? Well, I think Marvel was a little bit tired of that because Neil Donaldson was just born with his ability to disintegrate whatever he touches. After discovering his powers, he was hired by Obadiah Stane to eliminate the competition. However, James Rhodes, the acting Iron Man at the time, quickly got word of this and set out to take the termite down. During his third fight with the villain, the first two ending with the termite escaping, Rhodes was seemingly evenly matched with him until Tony Stark showed up with the mutant power neutralizer and shot the termite with it, removing his powers completely, allowing him to be arrested and taken to jail. Where did got back to Stain and he hired the Enforcer to take him out. However, the Enforcer was taken out first by the Scourge of the Underworld. So basically the Termite was saved completely by accident. The Termite was later seen sulking in jail and that's really the last we've seen of him. Check out this villain for yourself in his first appearance all the way back in 1984's Iron Man number 189. Number six, the Stark an alien race. When the Martian Masters invaded Earth for the second time, Tony didn't want his armor or technology to fall into the wrong hands. He feared if they got a hold of it, they would be way too powerful to handle. So he launched all of his technology into space. Unfortunately, a few years later, the very rocket holding all of Tony's technology landed on an alien planet. This alien race didn't know what to make of this rocket. They were quite primitive. They started experimenting with the technology and learning everything they could about what was in the rocket. They even named themselves and their planet, the Stark. I mean, that's dedication. With this new technology and armor, they were able to harness and they were able to conquer other worlds. Halfway through into number five, Fin Fang Foom. Okay, let's be honest. Most of the super villains that heroes fight are at least similar to them in some way. Most of Iron Man's villains have some form of robotic suits like his, but less efficient. Spider-Man's are mostly animal themed. However, when Iron Man went up against an actual f***ing dragon, we all seemed a little bit confused. That's Fin Fang Foom for you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, well, he's not an actual dragon, but for a while, the Mandarin, who was working with Finn did actually believe that he was a dragon of myths and legend. The two together ended up conquering a third of China, and honestly, that's kind of nuts. However, it was revealed that Finn was actually an alien and that his fellow aliens were coming to conquer Earth, resulting in Mandarin having to team up with Iron Man and War Machine to stop it. I'm sure Mandarin regretted this decision after he found out that, you know, he's an alien. I don't think the MCU is going to introduce Finn, I, at least yet, but honestly, I don't know anymore with the whole multiverse and now there's more happening and like a dragon and turns out to be an alien. It's probably, it's par for the course at this point. But I think that Fin Fang Foom is a little too much for the MC. You, eh. Number four, Zombie Iron Man. So in the comic series, Marvel Zombies, Iron Man is, well, 
the zombie. He attacks Silver Surfer at one point, but then is sliced in half by one of Silver Surfer's energy blasts. Since he is a zombie, he's that dead. He ends up eating some of the Silver Surfer's body and gains some of his abilities. With just gaining these new powers and with the arrival of Galactus, Iron Man and some others fly up and eat Galactus. Yep, they straight up eat him. They gain his powers and form a group, the Galacti. Number three, Mr. Doll. Now I know what you're thinking and no, his first name wasn't Ken. That would just be way too good of a joke. Nathan Dolly was a pretty average dealer in curios and art objects until he came across an extraordinary doll during his time in Africa. He discovered that he could reshape this doll to resemble whomever he wanted, and that he could cause that person to feel immense pain by manipulating the doll's features. He decided the best way to use his new voodoo doll was to coerce rich business people into legally signing over control of their business to him, which worked pretty great for him until he decided to go after Tony Stark. Tony found it tough to fight against this villain because initially he was unable to withstand the pain caused by the doll. So in true Tony Stark fashion, he built a suit just for the occasion. Now able to withstand the power, Tony used a force beam to change the doll's likeness into that of Mr. Doll's, and the immense pain this caused Mr. Doll caused him to pass out, allowing for his capture and arrest. Fast forward a bit and we see Mr. Doll once again, however this time his consciousness is trapped and split between two mannequins, Jake and William, aka the Brothers Grimm. This didn't last for too long though because he was eventually beaten by Spider-Woman and his consciousness dispersed for good. Take a look at the voodoo doll wielding Mr. Doll for yourself in his first appearance in 1963's Tales of Suspense number 48. Number 2, Iron Maniac. Iron Maniac is from an alternate universe, Earth 5012 to be exact. In this world, almost all of the other Avengers were killed by a Super Skrull. Also in this world, Tony became more and more crazy as time went on, with a lot of it happening because of the loss he experienced. In this world, he also ended up becoming obsessed with Reed Richards, who he believed was becoming too power hungry. Tony became more unhinged, even killing that world's Black Widow and Wolverine. But that's not all, folks. He then took on the Fantastic Four and killed Johnny Storm, aka the Human Torch, after Johnny, per permanently scarred Tony's face. Reed eventually found a way of stopping him by sending him to another Earth, the main Earth, Earth 616. Number one, Ultron, MCU version. So in the MCU, Ultron is created by, you guys guessed it, Tony Stark. After the events of the first Avengers, Tony is still dealing with the trauma of that alien invasion. He wants to make sure that if there is ever another attack, the world will be prepared. So Tony starts the Ultron program using the Mind Stone from Loki Scepter. At first, they just look like variations of armor that Tony has worn in the past, but controlled with his AI, basically to protect Earth against any threats to it. But Ultron deems the human race as the greatest threat against Earth, so instead of protecting the humans, he's going to wipe them out. Yeah, that's kind of dark. He was doing this initially with assistance from Quicksilver's Scarlet Witch, but Ultron's plan was coming together. His second form was made from Vibranium. His plan was to lift up a city in Sokovia and allow it to come crashing down like a meteor to wipe out humanity. Obviously, the Avengers were able to stop him and he was destroyed by Vision in the end. An intent Firebrand. A superpowered enforcer for Justin Hammer, Firebrand is a former activist who turned to violence after believing peaceful protest produced no results. Which sounds awfully familiar now thanks to the Flag Smashers introduction, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. First appearing in Iron Man Volume 1 number 27 from 1970, Gary Gilbert was born in Detroit, Michigan. Gary wore a suit with an armored exoskeleton that gave him superhuman strength and resistance to fire. It also housed flamethrowers, which allowed him to like shoot out, you know, fire and thermal blasts from his hands, one mounted on each wrist, and flying jets that gave him the ability to fly, which I'm pretty sure sounds familiar at this point. Except with the Flag Smashers having already been introduced and no Iron Man remaining in the MCU as a counter, Firebrand making an appearance seems a little far-fetched. It's still entirely possible, like perhaps this version gets inspired by the Flag Smashers and maybe Peter or someone has to end up dealing with them, but it would be on a much smaller scale since with all the movements, Marvel could be worried about upsetting people and I don't think that they would handle, uh, I don't know how they would handle this one. In at 9, Spymaster. First introduced in Iron Man number 33 in 1971, the original Spymaster was leader of the espionage elite and they were a formidable opponent for Iron Man. Man, and successfully infiltrated Stark Industries on more than one occasion. Man, it's like Star Labs, just walk in the front door. He's also evaded Iron Man's grasp multiple times. After his operative, Mark Sharon, was killed by the ghost while using the Spymaster identity, the original Spymaster just let the world
world believed that he was dead. Others have attempted to assume the role as Spymaster, but none really did all that well. Years later, he returned to action after being found by Norman Osborn, but quickly returned to the shadows. He owned a supervillain club, and when the Avengers left Earth in order to battle the Builders, he gathered a group of supervillains and then broke in Stark Tower to steal Iron Man's technology, because the tower was basically defenseless. And while this could be plausible, seeing how Iron Man is dead so his compound would remain partially unguarded, I don't think that the MCU is going to go this route, even if the character has been around for 50 years. It's actually, it was actually 50 years this January, which is kind of nuts. And it ate Blizzard. Dr. Gregor Shapanka, PhD, was an employee of Stark Industries. He was conducting private research into a means of achieving physical immortality when first introduced in Tales of Suspense number 45 in 1963. However, he attempted to rob a private vault of Anthony Stark so he could obtain microtransistor designs that Shapanka had intended to sell to further finance his research because, you know, he was trying to be immortal. And that's what everyone does when they want to be immortal. However, he was caught and unsuccessful because, you know, it was stupid. I guess he didn't have the Thieves Guild training like I do. Like, I mean, I'd show the tattoo, but I have like a full sleeve on and a suit, so I can't really, but still. Anyway, he was brought before Stark, who then fired him, understandably, because, you know, he tried to steal from him. Subsequently, Shapanka also created a suit that could generate intense cold, which he had hoped to slow his own aging process. And he then started using the suit and its abilities to commit crimes in order to, you know, get more money to fund more research, because, you know, everyone needs that villain. Doc Ock, Jack Frost, well, I mean, the news media had called this new criminal Jack Frost, which is an insult to the man who played Jack Frost in the Santa Claus 3, who, who also played Mr. Honeywell on How I Met Your Mother. Anyway, he later changes his name from Jack Frost to Blizzard, and eventually the suit comes into the hands of Donnie Gill, who assumes the title in 1987, after Gregor's death in The Amazing Spider-Man Annual number 20 in 1986. Number 7, The Infamous Iron Man. So, Dr. Victor Von Doom becomes Iron Man. Yeah, it's real, and I'm not joking. So, the man who was once evil turned good, kind of, with some help of Miss Fantastic to help redeem Doom's soul. He does in fact turn good. Stark and Doom become close, but after the Battle of Civil War II, with Captain Marvel defeating and severely injuring Iron Man, Doom decides to become the infamous Iron Man to try to right the wrongs of his past. I know he technically isn't like super evil while he's doing it, but come on, he's Doctor Doom, so you never really know. He's always planning something. Like, it's Dr. Doom. And it's 6, Titanium Man. First introduced in Tales of Suspense number 69, nice. From 1965, not as nice, Boris Bolsky quickly rose through Soviet government ranks and became popular in the Communist Party. He had also briefly worked with Black Widow as an intelligence agent, but due to political reasons, he was assigned to Serbia. He learned that some of the camp members were scientists that had worked with Anton Vanko, who, as I mentioned last number, was the Crimson Dynamo. So Bolsky planned to make a new armor set capable of defeating Iron Man to prove the USSR's superior priority over the US, because of course that's why. The titanium alloy armor was made, however, and it was much larger and heavier than Iron Man's, due to the camp lacking sufficient resources to design micro components. Because, you know, Tony Stark built this in a cave! With a pile of scraps! Bolsky was unable to defeat Iron Man on several occasions. However, I don't think this character would be introduced because they already made reference to him in the first Iron Man movie, where Stark made his suit a gold titanium alloy, which I thought was funny since people were calling him Iron Man, but in reality it was gold titanium alloy man. But like, you know, that line now makes more sense with, <laughs> with this. Plus, Tony's dead, so I don't think they could want to beat Iron Man unless they go after like Pepper Potts or something. Number five, Doctor Strange. Now, I know what you're thinking and no, I'm not talking about Stephen Strange, the Sorcerer Supreme and Master of the Mystic Arts. I'm talking about Carlos Strange, who made his first and last appearance all the way back in 1963's Tales of Suspense number 41. Carlos Strange was just your typical mad scientist, creating and concocting all manners of weaponry in his mountain hideout when a lightning bolt struck him, increasing the electrical energy inside his brain, making him smarter and even madder than before. Six months after the whole lightning incident, Strange built an ultra-frequency transmitter from radio and television parts and used it to take mental control of Iron Man, forcing him to free him from his prison so he can enact his plan to take over the world and just give it to his daughter. Threatening to destroy the entire planet in 24 hours unless every nation surrenders to him, he launched a powerful bomb into the atmosphere to demonstrate just how serious he was. Iron Man quickly found his way to Strange's new hideout in the Atlantic and destroyed his main power source, effectively ruining his plan. With no other option, Strange withdrew and escaped custody and we're honestly not too sure what he's cooking up now. 
Check out his story for yourself and let me know what you think of his character in the comments below. And at four, Ultimo. Like I said last number, most supervillains at least base part of their persona off the hero because we all know villains just want Senpai to notice them. MatPat, I'm still waiting on you. Getting MatPat to notice me will literally be my supervillain origin story. Anyway, Ultimo is no different. However, he didn't really do this to himself. Ultimo is a giant robot created by an alien race that the Mandarin had taken control of. The cool one, not the actor. First introduced in Tales of Suspense number 76 in 1966, Ultimo only died recently in 2020, Force Works number 3 in June of 2020. While Ultimo was under his control, however, Mandarin claimed that Ultimo was his own creation. The only thing, though, that Mandarin actually created, besides changing his programming, was an artificial blue skin for the robot. Yeah. Mandarin utilized Ultimo numerous times against Iron Man, including once in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. During that battle, Iron Man trapped Ultimo beneath the Earth's crust, and as a result, the robot meandered through the planet's magma. J and you know what that caused him to do? Not melt but absorb more power. Years later, when Iron Man was in battle with like a rock creature who was called the Earth Mover for some reason in California, Ultimo re-emerged without his blue skin, significantly taller and much more powerful. He vaporized the Earth Mover in a second and destroyed a remote unit of Iron Man. And then, went around just destroying everything he could. So safe to say, it's probably a little too much for the MCU. Number three, Iron Patriot, the comic version. So in the comics, the government wants Norman Osborn to basically recreate the Avengers team. Yeah, you heard that right. Freaking Norman Osborn. So he creates the Dark Avengers and leads it as the Iron Patriot. Basically a combination of Iron Man, but with Captain America's colors. Now the MCU did a version of the Iron Patriot, but they did their own spin and made Rhodey the Iron Patriot. And he did work for the government. Eventually the Dark Avengers declare war on Asgard. Asgard is currently just hovering over a spot of land on Earth. With the siege of Asgard underway, Norman wants to use Sentry's evil side, Void, as a secret weapon to take the Asgardians down. He manipulates Sentry to allow Void to take over his body, and in the end, Norman is imprisoned on the raft. But, you know, he never stays there for very long. Penultimately, in at number two, the Mandarin. Okay, so while the Mandarin might technically have been introduced in Iron Man 3, he was used as a MacGuffin. The Mandarin wasn't actually a villain. He was just an actor who was covering up the actions of Aldrich Killian and AIM. Since Mandarin's iconic Ten Rings hadn't been introduced yet, which is kind of proof enough as to how the Mandarin was too powerful. And then comes the latest MCU installment, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. You've got to be kidding me. I'm actually upset that they introduced these because it totally ruins the ability to correct the Mandarin. I mean, you can't introduce the correct Mandarin now unless they end up using the name because they were inspired or something. But at this point, it's been so long that it wouldn't really make any sense. The McLuhan Power Rings grant the Mandarin insane powers, like manipulation of atomic and molecular structures, beams of force, vortex generation, disintegration, integration beams, creating areas of darkness, lighting fires from a distance, huh? mental manipulation, electrical blasts, and intense cold and ice control. How is this not the next big MCU big bad? Because he's too powerful. They literally had to make it Kang because they're like, oh, we're going to introduce the Ten Rings, but oh, no, ho, ho, ho. No, no. Finally, in at number one, Temujin. Temujin is actually the son of the Mandarin, who ends up inheriting the Ten Rings, which already makes him as powerful as his daddy. However, this in combination with his ability to focus Chi to give him super strength makes him even more powerful than his father, even nearly killing Iron Man once and for all, which would have been absolutely insane. So it's safe to say that this guy has to be number one, since he literally has the same powers as the real Mandarin and then some. Hopefully they don't, they don't make this guy into an actor or something ridiculous like that. That seems just sad.